My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Ron Ascierto. We're at the basement of Oakdale Restaurant in McMinnville. It's December 19th, 2022. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, first question to get us started is why wine? I think it goes back to probably my first, at least one of my first job in Fort Wayne, Indiana, of all places. I moved to the States when I was 15. It's kind of very significant because it's prior to the coup d'etat when Marcus was ousted. My adopted family, who was my aunt and uncle, at some point of like spring season, or we would call it, uh, around January of 1988, my father, my adopted father said, you're coming to the States. And from there, within two months, um, with, I don't know how he facilitated it or why, how my family facilitated I got my visa, my passport, and every paperwork you could possibly imagine that you need that I needed to come to the United, to the States. I didn't realize it then why he quickly did that, because he read a lot of uh, the New York Times, the Catholic Digest, etc. Mm -hmm. And from there, he knew something was about to happen uh, politically, economically, the situation in the Philippines kind of just kind of been built in and building and where the Marcos regime was about to be toppled. So from there, so yes, um, why wine? It started more of a, as a curiosity, because growing up both in the Philippines and as soon as I arrived to the States, I didn't know what wine is. Mm -hmm. The only probably alcoholic beverages that I was exposed to in the Philippines are Filipino gin, Filipino rum, and Filipino beer. That's it. No wine existed in the Philippines where I grew up. Um, I was born and raised, sorry, I was born in Manila in a little town called Kamiya City, but grew up in the province of Ilocos Norte North. Um, so all the way to the top tip of the left side, if you look at the map, uh, like right on by the China Sea, it's like on the top border, uh, past Baguio City, etc. So no, no wine, no alcohol. Um, if you drink alcohol in the Philippines back then, you can kind of like, it's just for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, there's certain people that would think you would abuse alcohol if you drink more than two or three drinks. Anyway, um, there was no law. I bought beer and gin to the grocery store or what you would call the Sari Sari store. Uh, your cousins and your uncles and your family said, here's 20 pesos, go buy me two beers and a bottle of rum. You go to the store, it's like, I need this for my uncle, etc. Anyway, yeah, no, no alcohol. So by the time I was 15 or 16, um, I wanted to work because I want, like, just to work, to work um, at, during school or after school or in the summer. I wanted to get a job and one of my family's friends in Fort Wayne, Indiana, was running this very, very high-end retirement home. I can't remember the name right now. And that retirement home had a dining room that was back then like pretty, like elegant, tablecloth, flowers on the table, etc. set up, big leather chairs or comfy chairs. And she said, come visit me, I'll put you to work. Cool. She put me to work by being an assistant, kind of like a busboy, you could say, to the server. Then the server teach you what to do. You serve them lunch and dinner. But at lunch, the, the residents had wine. And they would say, we have to serve them these. And these are what we, they, their selections. It's like, what is this? It's wine, it made of grape juice, it's like curiosity, yeah, cool. You taste it, it's alcohol, cool. Um, so I was, I guess, yeah, 16, 17. 
from there, the servers that I was working with invited me to like weekend parties and they would have wine coolers <laughs> and cheap wines and box wines. I didn't know there were cheap wines and box wines, don't get me wrong. So I drank them, it's like, oh cool. You get the buzz, you get the thing, but it's cool. The, the different flavor profiles of it kind of got me more interested. So more and more, as I worked for them for like less than a year, I realized they were, we were serving different wines. And the, um, her name is Auntie Tess. We call her Auntie Tess. I called her Auntie Tess. Um, we call everybody Auntie Tess in the Filipino way. So once you know everybody, it becomes relative. Anyway, <laughs> Auntie Tess would say, Oh, because I asked her, what is wine? She started talking to me a little bit of wine, mostly California wines, because that's what we were serving. Um, and just just giving me background of the stories of who made it, why they made it, what history of wine was. So I started kind of like going to the library and just reading a few books. But I'm not very well read. I've never been. Um, I was lazy in school back in, in the Philippines. Anyway, from there, it kind of evolved into I was working dinner and they had more wines and different wines. Now it's a bottle instead of just pouring them a glass and they have a selection of it. And these were very, very well funded, I don't know, rich, really rich retirees because I think they give a, you give your life savings to them and they take care of everything. Mm -hmm. They even have a helicopter pad in the property. So just in case somebody had an emergency, that's how um, high end this was. And I'm like, innocent me, like, where am I um, <laughs> back then, as I look back now. So from there, it evolves to, oh, I want to work more with this. I want to work more in food and hospitality. Just because I think it's always inside me that the cooking, like entertaining people. I think looking back at it right now, growing up, there's always a party in the Philippines, but it's not a party. It's just mostly what you could consider a gathering. Um, your relatives or your neighbors always want to feed you. So when you visit somebody, it's always the first thing that they ask you is, have you eaten? <laughs> or the phrase, kuma in kana. Or that's how we greet people. It's not, hello, how are you today? You walk in the door is, have you eaten? Did you drink something today? What have you eaten today? And there's always food when you visit somebody or when you, you talk to people. So it's always been that gathering, hospitable thing. I didn't, again, growing up there, you didn't realize that, but it's the norm. It's kind of like part of the culture in the Philippines growing up. So with that said, it's like, oh, I, I like this. I like, to, I like to be hospitable. I like to be the person that, what would you like to drink today? What do you feel like eating today? Because you have choices. Do you want salad or soup today? Do you want the pork dish or do you want the fish dish today? Like that to me appealed really well because it's more, it's, I don't, I, I, it's not like I was forced to do it. I loved it. Mm -hmm. There was something in there. I didn't understand it till later in my career in the hospital, hospitality, food and hospitality. It was there. It's like, welcome and then you feed them and they're happy. I think that happiness kind of just starting to get to it. So from there, um, I worked everywhere because I just wanted to try. I was interested, I was curious from McDonald's to Applebee's, Red Lobster. Um, there was another seafood fast food restaurant in the Midwest, but I did it all where to where I, I was a host, I was a server, I was a back bar back, I was a back waiter. I kind of did hold the whole gamut until keep going to college. I paid my way through college. I was in nursing school. Again, that thing about hospitable, about taking care of people. It's just came naturally. So like, I'm gonna go to nursing school. It's like, just because again, it's the stereotype that all Filipinos are nurses. We're not, <laughs> uh, pardon me that, but 
it's the easiest way to get to the States or to get ahead. I think that's why most Filipinos go to nursing school. With that said, I wanted to go to nursing school, but I always wanted to be a doctor. However, again, I was not book smart. I was too lazy to read, I don't know, thousands and thousands of pages. So I was always being transparent. I was like, no, I don't want to read. But I can memorize things, but I don't want to read. I'm always one of those uh, action learner, you could say. If you do things, I can do it better. Hmm. Like personally, rather than reading it and getting instruction on how to read it. But I love nursing tool. I went for about three years while working in the restaurant industry. And then probably my second or maybe the last semester of my second year in nursing school, I realized I love the restaurant industry because I was already working at all those places. And I found this job, don't know how, applied for it. I got interviewed. It's called Sycamore Hills Golf Club in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And back then, that little tiny club was on the Golf Digest as one of the best tiny golf club in America. And the dining room was beautiful and big, so it reminded me of the nursing home, or the retirement home, that it had tablecloths, not just one tablecloth, it's three layers of tablecloths, because you have your underlay, your overlay, and then your runners. And then you have your plate chargers, where it's three layers of plates. You have your large plates, your middle plates, and your appetizer plates. You have three different sets of uh, spoons and forks on each side with another spoon and, and fork on top. They walk me through that interview, and I'm like in awe. I don't know. There was just the awe of all of that. The beautiful dining room with the fireplace, um, the flower arrangement, the candle holders, just the, the pristineness of that dining room kind of appealed to me back then. However, they started me at what they called the men's club, where it's the men's locker room is next to the bar, but women can only go if their husbands or their partner can go there. And, but they switch it up the, year, the second year I was there. Um, so everybody can go there. But there's also another bar into the men's club. And that's how it started me. And uh, there was a gentleman, African-American guy, that was running the bar and the beverage program for them. He hired, I got hired. And it's like, you're going to be trained with him because you need to learn everything and anything because he knows every club member. It's cool. I followed him for two days. He tells me everything about alcohol, about wine, about this, about scotch, about cigar, and I'm like lost. <laughs> lost to the T to where like, I don't have that background. I don't know how to do any of that. I'm like, well, just follow my lead. Cool, follow my lead. I know how to serve table just by working at the nursing home, the left, the right, they taught, they taught you all that, the classic service. Uh, polite, yes sir, yes ma'am, there's never a no, we'll do everything for you kind of situation. But the other, that one is more club. So I worked that, they really, they think I was good. So they moved me to the dining room. I got trained into the dining room. I, it become formal, because on the club you wear just the golf shirt and a black pants as a uniform. On the other side, they give you a tuxedo. <laughs> And they have, you have to go buy new shoes, black shoes, et cetera. I kind of enjoy that as well. So I got trained by this old couple that's been there they, with the formal dining and how to present coffee. Like even the little things, that, how to present coffee and, or how to make sure that your salt and pepper are aligned with the middle <laughs> at 12 o'clock on your charger plate where everything has to be one inches. And I was like, cool, I like this. I like the discipline of this. I can work with this. And it was, so I got trained, I followed them. Just the, I think for me, it's that sequence of you greet. They get seated, you tell them the dishes, 
you tell them the specials from the chef. And I enjoyed all that sequence of service. It's not even about the wine and food back then yet. It's that sequence of service and hospitality. And when they say goodbye, thank you, that was one a great meal, you can kind of like, yeah, that's my reward. Mm -hmm. Plus, because it's a, it's a golf club, they paid me well. <laughs> I like, I thought like I was making so much money versus the other restaurant, Tiny Louis. They paid you hourly, really good hourly. They gave you health insurance. They gave you everything and you had perks to the club. So why not work here? And eventually you realize that I realized that I can make money out of this that I'm better at it than probably going to school because I was already kind of supporting myself for that because I was always been independent as an adopted kid in my family that adopted me kind of instilled that in me. It's like, you're going to be independent. You want to work, you want to go to school, that's up to you. There's no rule for you because you're an American now. If you don't want to go to school, you don't have to go to school. But one thing we you always have is a home for here. So from there, I just became independent by the time I was six, 17, 18. I wanted to work. I wanted to put myself somewhere. So I kept working and working. And that gentleman, African-American gentleman, taught me about scotches, taught me how to cut a cigar, taught me about Robert Mandavi, um, how to open a bottle of wine, how to present a bottle of wine, and how to be the most hospitable person where you stand, where, whether you stand from the right or the left, where to face, what to say in a language where it's not a servant or servitude, it's just the art of service and hospitality because he's literally been doing this all his life. So that got me more curious. Where can I take this? He would do tasting with me and wine. I would love it, but we again, mostly California wines and some French wines back then. So I end up learning more, a little bit more about California wine, drinking white Zinfandel, red Zinfandel, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir from the Sonoma. It go on and on and on. So by the time I wanted to quit nursing school. I said, where can I go that I could increase, I guess, what this hospitality is and where I could earn money, I could earn a living. Um, so Indianapolis was the next step. I researched Indianapolis. There was a couple of restaurants in Indianapolis that doing well. The first thing I wanted to work for was called St. Elmo's Steakhouse. It's one, it was one of the oldest. I believe it still exists, but with a different name and different ownership. One of the oldest steak, independently owned steakhouses in the United States. I researched them. Back then it was hard to, like, it wasn't like Instagram or social media, but I knew who they are. I drove to Indianapolis and drive around where I could go and it was pretty. Um, <laughs> I think by the time I was in my mid-twenties, that's when I was doing it. So I went to the bar and observed. It's like, I want to work here. So I asked the bartender, it's like, so how could I work here? And they said, you can't. <laughs> it's like, why? See all these old men running around and old women running around here? They've been here for decades. They won't leave. These people have put up their kids through college because they make so money and they get taken care of here. And it's like, how did you get this job? You just got lucky. They needed a bartender. Those old men and women does not want to be a bartender. So I was already bartending and I kind of knew the manager, but it took me years. I said, you can't work here. You'll be on the wait list. There's a lot of people that has more that's what he literally, honestly, because we had the conversation prior to that. And I was like, dang, it's like, I need a job. I want to move to Indianapolis. I might go back to school, I might not, but it's like, what's your experience? So I told him my experience in a nursing. It's like, you can get any job just because you know fine dining, probably. It's like, yeah, I know fine dining. How well versed are you on your food and, and your wine? It's like, not well. It's like, learn your wine, learn your cocktails, your classic cocktails. You go from there, 
And this bartender slash now was also the GM then, eventually became the GM of that saint, um, that steakhouse. It's like, go look at these places, they might find. So the first one that, like, I didn't know it then, she t he told me was called Peter's. Peter's was a restaurant, probably one of the first restaurant in Indianapolis that was farm to table, fine dining, beautiful wine list. I applied. They like my demeanor, supposedly. I got hired as a host. So I said, how can I get to the serving position? Because I really want to learn more about serving. Like I can, um, the manager then told me, I can teach you all about wine, but you can't. It'll be a wait for you. You're third in line or fourth in line to be the next server, just because same thing, they had older that have been there, more experienced, and they know what they want. It's like, cool, I can do that. So I became a host, and I, just me being competitive, I guess, in my nature without me knowing that I'm competitive, <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna work this. I'm gonna be the best host. I'm gonna know every person to come to the door, because that was the policy to begin with. I'm gonna know everything about them. I'm gonna be the perfect host when I answer the phone, how to, put on their coat, and how to take care of everything about them. So again, the hospitality innately come through as well as being competitive. I worked there for two years, sorry, year and a half or so. I loved it. This Again, the sequence of service, um, remembering like we they ironed their tablecloths. The servers ironed their tablecloths. It's perfectly creased. The design was beautiful. The lining was beautiful. Every little nuances, and then, and you needed to learn everything. I almost become a server there until nobody would leave. <laughs> so I was next in line, but nobody would leave. Nobody would go somewhere else because they were making money and they they would love what they do. So I was like, okay, how can I, where can I go to become a server? Sure enough, there was a restaurant that opened called Mikado. It's a Japanese restaurant. I didn't know Japanese food then either, but I took a chance. I said, I want to be a server. This is my experience. Good enough that I was Filipino and they're looking for more Asian background. So I got hired. Uh, his name was Joseph Lehner. He's the GM, short white guy, loved him to death, still do love him to death. He asked me, what do you want to do and why do you want to become a server? I was like, it's not being a server, I'm the host. And I love what I do because I make people happy. I said, you're hired. <laughs> That's like, those are the few words. And then ever since then, you can kind of refine yourself. You refine everything, what you do, whether it's the casualness or the formality. But Mikado was a sushi bar. It's a, it was a sushi bar. They just closed last year um, because they couldn't renew the lease. Um, the landlord just wanted to kick them out and wanted something else. Um, it gone through rough patches too, but I, loved every minute, every second. They were my family, they became my family, they're still my family. Then I worked there for almost a decade in and out. It was a Japanese restaurant that I made, I told the owners we need to be more fine dining. Even though it was a casual, I served fine dining there. I was probably the most formal person you could say I became, I was a server, I was a bartender, I was a manager, I did everything for them. And Joseph Leonard teach me more about Oregon wine, Burgundy wine, and champagne, as well as cognac, Armagnac, and ports. So he's kind of probably one of the people, people that has influenced me throughout. From there, I met people, celebrities, 
from the Heidi Klum of the world to Seal to the David Matthews Band, because <laughs> we were in the middle of Smack Thing, to hanging out with Ted Danson and Kevin Kastner at, it's called the Canterbury Hotel across the street. It's kind of like the Ritz-Carlton of Indianapolis back then, because it, that's what they're um, kind of like what they were aspiring to. Mm -hmm. And we went to the bars there after we we're done with work because there's, there's the hotel bar and then the restaurant and then there's the regular bar. And so you went there because it's fine dining and it's formal and we're not formal at Mikado. I'm slinging in chops, uh, using chopsticks and uh, um, yakitoris and sushis were formal, but we were busy, so we go there after work, and we just had a good time. But because we were in the middle, I think you had conventioners, you had motorcycle, you entertain all these people. It's like so again, that innate hospitality. You treated everybody equally, uh, whether again, like I said, a celebrity, a baseball player, or um, Reggie Miller of the the historic. Pacers come to you and dine at the sushi bar, you hang out with him, or um, Harrison, um, what's his first name? He was one of the, probably one of the best wide receiver Colts have ever had with Mar Indianapolis. Marvin. Colt. Marvin, see, you know Marvin. Hang out with him, or once in a while, um, I think we find it, I finally served him prior to him retiring or moving out of India. I'm like, Manning finally came to eat with us, but he doesn't eat sushi back then. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he does. He still doesn't. It's funny. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to, like, where else can I take that? Again, the question is, where else can I take this? What else can I do? With that said, the family, the Omnicado, expanded. Uh, they had two other restaurants, um, a Chinese restaurant and a French-Asian restaurant. And I ran the other one. I was running, kind of running both. So it's called, it was called Five Spice, and because of Joseph Lehner, we developed the wine list with more French and Oregon wine because of the French-Asian cuisine, and he added more champagne. I learned more, started learning more champagne, and that's kind of been the go-to aspect of it. Uh, from there, um, Tasting Menu was developed, and then I didn't know what Tasting Menu back then, uh, but her name is Juping Chi. She was brilliant, but crazy. Uh, if she were ever to see this, she would admit to that. <laughs> she was probably, if she wasn't crazy, I would probably still be working for her for the rest of my life. She was brilliant in every way. Her sister, um, you may was brilliant in every way with their cooking and their hospital hospitable. Their uh, you may's daughter Connie is just smart, business smart too. So he ran, she ran, finally ran the family business after she came back. But with that said, I learned everything more about fine dining, about modern cuisine from Juping, even though she didn't have a formal. Um, education in cooking, but she's cooked all her life as a child because she came from Beijing, China, and she had a formal education at Rice University in Texas. So, and she was very, very well read. She knew what Michelin star before I knew what Michelin star was. She taught me about Michelin star and looking like, like what are you talking about? <laughs> I want to put Michelin star in Indianapolis. That's never going to happen. Um, but she ate at Michelin stars in Europe. Uh, her husband uh, was Romanian, so they had the opportunity to go to Europe it, at Michelin stars, like go to uh, uh, French Laundry, Charlie Trotters, all of that. So she started talking to me about that. I was like, you should aspire to be that. You should aspire to serve, whether it's wine or hospitality. You should aspire to do that, because at back then, that's or it still is, right? It's still the echelon of what fine dining and what hospitality should be. So she taught me about that. She taught me about design, an eye for design, the lighting. It's not just about the food and the wine and being hospitable. It's the entire um, room, the entire like experience anymore, whether 
and she loved this is probably one of the best thing about her how crazy she is like most people don't think about it but when you go to the bathroom you almost don't want to go to the bathroom because it's the bathrooms are just bah, right so in her crazy mind she switched the bathroom into the most serene place in the restaurant where my job before we open is the bathroom part of the GM's job is the bathroom is the most is the cleanest space in your restaurant she taught me that I want to express that because you go to places and they don't think about bathrooms more and more people are now thinking about bathrooms right so in my experiences bathrooms are kind of like the kitchen if your bathroom is as good as that so that she influenced me I, I'm telling you this because she has influenced little details for me she <laughs> taught me lighting she taught me color combination that it matters when you're dining because if the lighting is destructive or the color scheme of the room is off you'll notice that in your dining you'll notice that in your experience and in your hospitable who wants to work in a bad lighting or really bright colors where the servers need to like wash everything every night things like that it matters to her so she taught me little things like that that influenced me in my career to coming here as well eventually and keep going and going mm -hmm. from there she closed the restaurant I didn't know what to do I'm out of school I was pissed at her <laughs> I love that restaurant I live and breathe in that restaurant it's tiny I, I wish I could find more pictures because I want to repost it on Instagram or something like that it was beautiful all it was just beautiful the way she designed it we had live bamboo trees inside by the windows and every season every month she would change what's on the ground whether it's river rocks just because it's summer or she would just go to the flowers market and just dump a bunch of fresh flowers and let it die for the next week and people would love it like specifically this is her crazy being crazy her artistic ability to put a room together in three seconds is incredible the bathroom always change whether it's the candle or the paint she would literally repaint the job at midnight or the bath falls. So by the time I come back to work, I would go in there without her telling me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, what am I supposed to do with a yellow bathroom or something like that? It's like, figure it out. Yellow makes me happy. Cool. We're going to go get more yellow flowers to make you happy. There you go. Or put yellow fruit. She would tell me, put yellow fruit in the bathroom. So we would do little things like that where you, I go buy lemons and oranges and put them in basket and it's in a little table. And people were like, what are those lemon? Curiosity, right? Can't you so you change your experience? Again, it's all of that experience. It's not just about eating anymore. She changed that because she was brilliant. She closed the restaurant. But during that whole time that we were open, there was a couple named Mike and Jan Sweeney. They used to come once a week, or at least twice a month, three times a month sometimes. And they would dine with us because they live a few miles away, because they loved everything we do, the freshness, the French, French Asian cuisine, and she was amazing. Jupin was an amazing cook, etc. Or like the seasonal items that we would serve, such as white asparagus. I don't know where she find was it. White asparagus or truffles from Burgundy, things like that. Where she, we constantly evolved the menu because she was just brilliant. Who served Chinese pasta with French cooking? She did. I knew that from there. Who served you fresh 
rolled dumplings in front of you because they have there was a chef's table as well right to the kitchen it was a tiny kitchen and you get seated eight seat who serves fresh dumplings but then inside it is kind of like a take and mushu pork whatever it was then she shaped truffles and lemon butter on top of it and people like how did you come up with this dish i'm like oh yesterday <laughs> or this morning and i would look at her like what are you doing it's like there's no menu the chef's made there's no menu i cook whatever i want there's no allergies <laughs> that's when i knew it's like if you don't like pasta if you're allergic sorry you can't eat here and people would book that two or three people and it's like if you want to build and she had a minimum she knew all of this because of michelin star because she went to a few of them and because she was the crazy one so I wanted that, I wanted to enhance that. She would, and then we did wine pairing with it because Joseph Leonard told me to do wine pairing with it. We did sake pairing with it, we did champagne. Um, because my, the other thing that Joseph Leonard told me was sake because of the Japanese restaurant. So she, we did all of that. From there it transformed me to like, and I loved it and it's like, backtrack, what am I gonna do? Met Jan, Mike and Jan Sweeney. They used to come, they bring, their, they bring a bottle of wine they keep bringing this unlabeled bottle of wine and I never, like, I don't know how to ask them. It's like, where do you get this unlabeled bottle of wine? We just open it. Or oh, they'll bring burgundy because he likes burgundy. Uh, Mike likes burgundy. Or they like they will bring beautiful Chardonnays. Things like that. Or they'll just pick one or two of what we want and then they'll like, ah, it's okay. You should, you should put more Oregon wine in there. So, we announced that we were closing, etc. They come in, it's like, oh, you're closing, what are you gonna do? It's like, I don't know, to be honest. I might go on sabbatical. <laughs> I might go back home to the Philippines and never come back. I told my family, it's like, might be out of the job. Like, don't you have another, don't they have another restaurant that you could work for? It's like, I do, but I don't really wanna go back there. I love this restaurant. I tried to talk to people and finding to buying it, but. She said, we're not selling, we're just closing, etc. So she closed it. Mike and Jen Sweeney came the last couple of weeks prior to closing. And then they finally revealed that they own a winery in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, specifically in Rick Grill, Oregon. It's called in Eola Amity Hills. And I, I kind of knew a little bit about Oregon. I start studying more of my Willamette Valley ABAs, etc. Oh, I know the Willamette Hills because I drank Christum. I drank St. Innocent back then. I knew Van Duzer. I think the distributor in Portland was also pouring Argyle. And I know one of their sparkling wine and one of their wines was from, the fruit was from Willamette Hills. So I'm like, okay. So I was like, they literally blurted out, we're about to open a tasting room, we're about to, um, what do you call it? we're about to release our first vintage of our first wine, 2003, made by Tori Moore, and it's like, so I get, I, I, however, we need help, we don't know anybody, <laughs> and we really like you, could you sell wine, like, I can sell wine, I can sell any wine, like, what do you mean? And you sell them. It's like, well, it's different. It's the tasting room. It's the distributor. It's like, I literally said, I can learn. So from there, because of Mike and Jan Sweeney, I moved to Oregon. They said, would you like to go see Cherry Hill Winery? So um, Five Spies close. And uh, I met, again, Mike and Jan Sweeney uh, offered for me to fly to the Willamette Valley exactly to Cherry Hill. Uh, and I would stay at Cherry Hill. I didn't realize what the project was because, anyway, with that, I flew to Oregon from Portland, I'm uh, from uh, Indianapolis. 2004, around 2004, right after Valentine's Day, because that was the last service where we were 
we packed or I packed the restaurant to say goodbye. <laughs> this is one of the best restaurants that I'll ever have, but she's closing it. I flew, or Mike and Jan Sweeney flew me here, rented a car, drove to Tigard, drove to 99, and I'm feeling like, where am I? <laughs> not to say anything bad about Tiger, just the traffic was, not that he was horrendous, like wait. So I kept driving, there was no map quest or Google map or anything like that back then. So you, you rely on what I research and you printed every map and you mm -hmm. go, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm close, I'm close. By the time I get down, I remember this vividly very well, by the time I pass Sherwood into the blue signs of winery, it's like, okay, this is getting better. You come down to the hill from Rex Hill, there's more blue signs, and you keep going, you pass Newburg, and then you pass Dundee, and I saw the Argyle sign. I had the biggest smile. It's like, okay, cool. I pause. Keep driving. Then you saw the Archery Summit sign. You saw the Sokol Blosser, as well as the Domain Drain sign. I went through Lafayette. Then keep going through Amity, where you slow down. But by then, I'm like, I'm here. I'm gonna be here. That in my brain, in my mind, I just the landscape just kinda you're here, you have arrived. So you keep going, driving all the way to ninety nine, you pass Van Duser. The signs were there, the map was per my my printing was perfect, looking for that 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 tiny street that will take me to Cherry Hill on the dirt road. They told me take the dirt road. It'll be a mile and a half down the dirt road. They gave you the code, the tiny little road up to Cherry Hill Winery with the gate code. It was mid late afternoon. I uh, I was supposed to be meet, meeting the winemaker, uh, Chris Luby back then, um, but he was late. So it's like if he's not there, just go to this cabin. You, the winery is yours, walk around. I get to the cat code, punch in Mrs. Sweeney's birthday, pound, <laughs> because that's the code, that's still the code. Don't research that, I think you change it. <laughs> uh, the gate open, and up the hill, you see a new building, you see a bunch of cabins. Down the, wa down the hill with the vineyard, there's a water, and I pause. I think I had a pickup truck. I get out of that truck on the top of the hill, hop on the top of the bed of the truck, and stand there and just look around. And I'm like, holy cow. But I've only been to Napa and Sonoma once prior to that. But I knew what that was in, and I knew the big, but then I come to that and I fell in love with that. And again, in my mind, I have arrived. So I think the last one's like, I, I arrived at Cherry Hill. Yes, it was magical. It was, ma it was magical, you see that, and you drive down. And as soon as I drive down, find the cabin that they assigned me to stay in, I called Mike and Jen. They answered the phone. It was already probably 8 p.m. their time, because I arrived late afternoon here uh, in Oregon. And I said, what's the job? <laughs> Without even like talking about the job of the detail, without no nothing like what's the compensation, what do I do, How, like is it a temporary job, is it a full time job? I said, what is the job? Is it still available? I want it. And from there, I stayed with Cherry Hill. I set them up with their tasting room and hospitality. We had cabins that we use for entertaining guests. Mrs. Sweeney and I cooked for these guests. We paired wine, their wine, and some local Pinot Noir wines with 
the three course menu that we served. You can stay overnight, then you have dinner with us, actually not just dinner with us. I entertain you. Again, the hospital, like this is all learning curve for me. I didn't know how to run a tasting room. I didn't know how to run more and more like a BN Airbnb. I didn't know how to run kind of like what a hotel would do. So just learn. And Mrs. Sweeney said, this is what I do when my friends get here and they stay with us. And this is, I start with them uh, with cheeses and charcuterie or snacks. Uh, we sit on the vineyard by the vineyard and we open a couple of sparkling wine or champagne. Mike will provide you with all of that. So what, do you, what would you like to do? How would you like to set it up? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm learning. I know how to do that because I know what's coming out of the kitchen of a restaurant. If you tell me what you want to serve, from there on, I was very independent in entertaining. They said, you're in charge. And they gave me a little bit of budget or we go shopping at Ross and I just put cheeses and charcuteries or can we experiment that she would cook, she's a great cook. I would come and follow her lead on how to prepare appetizers, little things like that. So from there, we, I just loved it. I was independent. I was on my own. I only worked during the weekend. I opened the tasting room from, I think, Wednesday to Sunday and had my two days off. But if there's nobody there, I literally just, the vineyard is to myself for two years in and out. I also become their national salesperson. I sold wine at the tasting room and I sold wine nationally. Again, a learning curve. But prior to that, it's like, I gotta learn how to entertain people in the tasting room. And that's when I called Domain Drohan and Ashley Bell answered the phone. I introduced myself. I'd like to come in and taste wine with you, etc. And they just opened it up, uh, met Ashley and Aaron, and I was like, I observe how they do their tasting room. Then I just went to one tasting room after another. Um, I kind of knew the Argyle people back then because we were serving Argyle, so I connected with them. Um, the Bethel Heights crew was so hospitable when we would tell them, it's like, I'm across the street, I don't know what I'm doing. Can I come and taste wine with you? Sure. And I would just sit there, drink wine, and observe on how to be hospitable. And I emulated that in how I entertain people. And then I started asking, then once the season is out in the summer, it's like, what am I gonna do now? And it's like, you can sell wine. Do you wanna sell wine? It's like, sure, how much that pay? It was a good pay, I think. Uh, so I came back to Indianapolis a little bit and sell wine during, um, during the hiatus after the harvest is over. Um, but I, the one thing is I just miss the hospitality business. So after two years with running that bed and breakfast kind of thing and the tasting room, I said, I gotta move forward. I wanna go back to the restaurant industry. But prior to that, I got sick a little bit, so I had a hiatus with them. So they didn't know what, whether I would come back to them or not. With that said, during that two years that I worked for them, I met my partner in Portland. Uh, we had a long-term, long-distance relationship. I would come back and forth to Oregon uh, for the last two years that I wasn't working for Cherry Hill. And from there, I decided it's, like, it's time to move west because I miss Oregon, I miss the valley. So I moved in uh, with Jeff, my partner now, for almost 20 years. Um, sorry, 15 years. I moved in, I didn't have a job. I said I want to go back to the restaurant business. I was also taking some ISG class. Erica Landon actually taught one of the classes after I was started taking class from Chicago to here because I wanted to expand my knowledge more. Um, so with that said, 
I just needed to work. So I looked around, looked around. It's been probably really like blessing as well, or maybe I was right for the job. <laughs> Blue Hour needed an assistant manager slash manager as well. I researched Bruce Carey. My partner kind of knew Bruce Carey. And my partner's friends know about Bruce Carey Restaurant and Zephyro. So they told me, like, I had the inside knowledge of it and how to possibly get that job. So <laughs> I apply, walked in said the right thing. I think the first question he asked was, how do you define service as a manager in this hospitality business? I literally, my answer was like I was prepared because I think I knew that he might ask that. So I, I was prepared in a way that I didn't want to overthink it. I said, a manager I said it badly, maybe. A manager is the most overpaid busboy in a restaurant. And I'm also the water that flows on every crack on a dry land. So wherever a water is needed to flow, I am there for some reason. He had the biggest smile on that answer. Maybe he's never heard that before. I said that. And then he said, um, how, what was the other book? Then he, he, he asked me, is there, what's the last book you read about service? And I was like, there are books about service? <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's plenty of written books about service. And I was like, I only learn service in the places that I work for. Maybe he didn't like that answer. Maybe he did, that I was being transparent and honest about it. Within two hours, I got a call back. And I said, and his assistant said, Bruce Carey would like to see you another, for another interview. And I was like, another interview? Well, we're thinking we might move you to the other restaurant called Saucebox. And cool, I like Saucebox. I've been there before. Um, but I said, Saucebox is not for me, even though I have an Asian cuisine background. I would rather learn and work in a more fine dining establishment. Oh, Bruce just want to talk to you. So his assistant and I met. Then Bruce comes. And within an hour again, I got an offer the job. And I learned from him. What I learned from him is almost similar to what I learned in Japan, is the aesthetics and the design, as well as what hospitality should be. It's not just about the food and the wine anymore. It's the entire experience. Again, the same thing, the bathrooms, the linens, the uniforms. What, but more and more, the balance, like the beverage program mm -hmm. is there too. There's, there's a balance in everything. So he asked me, what sh I said, I want to work for you for a very long time, but one thing I want to know is, can I be the beverage director? And he's like, no, because there's three people in line. I'm like, crap, here we go again. I'm the third or the fourth in line. I think Erica, no, not, Erica wasn't writing the wine list back then for BCR. He, somebody else was. And I was like, man, I can never get ahead. And so I said, OK, I'm cool. And it's like, are you going to quit on me now? And it's like, no, I'll be here for a while. And like, you never know. Um, then there's a project that came around called Lucier. Um, it was a project by the Dustin family group called this Old Spaghetti Factory. Um, a gentleman named Donnie Sullivan, who was also a former general manager at Blue Hour, keep coming back to the restaurant while he was doing the project. He left Portland for a while. Donna Sullivan is another influencer in my career because I learned to be a general manager in a, on the business side and more on the business side and more really, really the professional fun side too. So Lucier opened and then 
I needed another job. I needed another outlet. I want to keep going. Blue Hour wouldn't give me the one I want. So it's like, okay, I got to find something. Then Departure at the Nines had an ad for a GM that has experience in both wine, sake, and Asian cuisine. I showed that to my partner. It's like, rewrite my resume, please. Help me rewrite my resume to make it look good. This is mine. This is my job. This is a perfect fit for me. I got interviewed twice. Then they lost. I lost connection for some reason. They never follow up. Like, I emailed them a couple of times, no response. Man, all they had to say is you didn't get the job. I keep looking at whether departure at the rooftop of the Nines Hotel in downtown Portland is opening up. Nope, they haven't opened up. It's under construction. There were issues with the construction. It's like, okay, so maybe they haven't decided. I inserted that because K, because I was waiting. I was already wanting to leave departure at Blue Hour. However, it delayed, so I didn't hear back from them. Here come Donnie Sullivan visiting Blue Hour while I was still there. It's like, hey, we opened Lucier. If you ever want another outlet, come see me. So in he entertained me. I think he gave me a free dinner or comp my dinner and had this experience of uh, parade service, Michelin star quality food, beautiful room, tablecloth, all the shebang, great wine list, um, caviar and cheese service that I've never experienced before, but I know them, right? I've eaten a couple of places like that before. So I finally said yes to Donnie. I get interviewed by the Dessen family. He said, like, I'm going to train you to be an assistant GM. I'm going to train you to be an operation manager. And from there, I said, but I want to learn more about wine. I want to learn to be the beverage director. I think I know how to be a GM now. It's like, I'll give it to you slowly. Mm -hmm. We have a wine director right now. There's two some. They probably want that job more than you do, but I want to train you to be the operation manager. Fortunately, after three or four months of running it and being the operation manager, we got a really bad review. They closed. <laughs> so, and this is like before the holiday. And I'm like, God. Why can't this kind of restaurant open it up? Because I love that fine dining aspect. I love the wine. I love the service. So I was like, I'll, I'll take a chance. I'll email departure again. Sure enough, they called me the next day. I think some of them like, we're very apologize. We apologize. We lost all of our IT because we move a construction zone to another construction zone where our offices would be. We lost touch. I'm so glad you called us back or you emailed us back because you're the front runner to be the GM of departure. I go back and it was another GM job. I called it my master thesis in, what's the word I'm using over here? Master thesis in entertaining thousands of people almost every night. We opened Departure with a bang. It's the only rooftop restaurant in Portland. It was at the height of recession. I set up the wine list, the sake. I started to know how to be everything from the GM, from the becoming the beverage director. It's like, this is my full on, well-rounded. I see all the numbers. This is my master in being in the restaurant industry, of being like running a restaurant. And I learned so much, not just, I mean, different style of hospitality, but the numbers. Important aspect on how to run a business. And that's all part of it. It's not just because it's pretty or 
it's good food mm -hmm. or you have great, amazing employees. There's all other nuances. I stayed there for about a year or so. Unfortunately, I had to leave. I thought I was going to go to Burgundy. That fell off. So it's like, oh, I quit, but no job now. <laughs> um, and then another one fell into me for some reason. And there's always this, like, I get, I've been very fortunate in my career. I went to the Allison Inn and Spa, a jury at the Allison. And that's when I told myself, it's time for me to come back to the Valley. It's time for me to reconnect with all the winemakers and all the tasting rooms that I met while I was at Cherry Hill. Again, the same thing, coming back and working, even though I commuted 45 minutes to an hour every five days a week, the joy that it brings when I see winemakers or when you entertain guests from out of town, it, 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 was, it was fueling me to keep continuing on. Mm -hmm. And just again, meeting and learning more about wine, learning how to be more hospitable, learning other aspects of hospitality besides the food and the beverage. So continue to that, and from there, a gentleman named Don Kanya that owned a company in Hillsboro, or CEO of a company in Hillsboro, uh, their company kept using the Allison Inn and Spa as their hub, they would dine with us, and they would always do a tasting menu with wine pairing or buy, and I've always been the one that, I entertained them the first time, and they like they always requested, like, hey, are you going to be in this day? So we exchanged for them, and I was like, I would like you to set up my next dinner, I'm entertaining these people, or it's, it's, all, our, it's all our top employees from them. I had a great relationship with a lot of other people as well. And then he asked the question, what's next for you? And I said, what do you mean? What's next for you? It's like, is this it? Are you going to stay with this style of service, with this restaurant for the rest of your life? And it's like, I said if I could run a champagne-focused, Oregon and Burgundy-focused wine bar, I would. It's like, why don't you write a business plan and present it to me? Out of the blue. It's like, what? I said, I know how to run a restaurant. I know how management is. I don't know how to write a business plan. <laughs> it's like, you can write a business plan. Write what you want to do. Calculate how much it costs, because you know what the costs are. Present to me and see what I can do. And that's he invested in my little wine bar shop called Muselet, M-U-S-E-L-E-T. It's the wire case of a champagne. Nobody has that name. I'm the only one because I love champagne. Um, I can expand on that, but it's okay. Um, I just love sparkling wine as well. So it was short, but it was a passion project. It, wasn't, it was the wrong time, the wrong location to open that style of restaurant. I wish I could have opened it like five years later, but it is what it is. You tried, you failed, you learned, you cry, you cry some more, you miss some more. But we did have some accolades. Um, it was on the Wine Enthusiast Top 100 Best New Wine Restaurant in the country. I went to New York City and I had a plaque. Cool stuff. So good memories, all great memories, but you always keep learning more because I, I focused on Oregon wine. I focused on champagne. With that stint, you met more Oregon winemakers. You met all these people. So you keep going. Um, I didn't want it to stop. I wanted to continue, and so I sacrificed myself, not paying myself, um, and did all my pop-ups, um, did some private dinners and wine consulting as well. That was fun, but it was hard work. Anybody that's listening to this or going to see this, you, ha you can't be on your own. Don't be arrogant. Don't be too prideful that you think you can do everything. I can't do everything. I failed 
I had some successes. I failed more. And you keep learning on that, but I've never once said I want to change my profession or go back to nursing school or back to school. I think it's always in me that this is what I want to do. This is always what I have to do is the hospitality industry. And from there, I consulted with another winery that's being built right now. Um, I hired the winemaker. He was another one of those where he came to all of my places and they saw something in me. It's like, would you like to help me build the winery? Sure. Uh, however, that's delay. It was just mostly a consulting gig. The delay kind of like, what am I going to do next? And I guess the connection with all your friends and other people kind of lead you to these kind of places, right? So I get choked up when somebody asks me, how did you come about of being at Okta? Uh, because a friend of a friend gave my Musele pop-up card, because she attended it, to Christine, who is the GM of Okta, um, because um, Deb Schwarzman is her name, said you have to go see Ron's pop-up. Ron knows everybody in the valley. If you ever need someone to talk to you about Oregon wine, Ron should be your guy. Uh, you should definitely attend her pop -up, his pop-up. Lo and behold, I get a call if I would like to talk to them about this project, but I didn't know anything about this project. Um, I said yes, and the first question, Christine's like, do you know who Matt Leitner is? Like, of course I do. And from there, we talked. I met Christine and Matt at the farm, and that's how I have booked that. And from there, they said, would you like to write some kind of like a dream wine list? It's like, what's a dream wine list? It's like, write what you think what a dream wine list should be, or to become the beverage director. Knowing from there, I think just like it kind of almost validate that I've worked my ass off, I guess, to where I'm at. I worked hard, um, never give up on that. So here I am. Um, hopefully, I'll be here for a long time um, because it's kind of on your bucket list to work for chef like Chef Matt Leitner into this cup to the caliber of not just the beverage or the food program, but the entire immersive hospitality that woke, that we want to be in, mm -hmm. or that this project that Sean Kajiwara and Katie Jackson want to have. I kind of like, yeah. Um, I think I told Christine, I don't care what I do, I want to be a part of this program. <laughs> and so that's where we're at, and that's where I'm at. Um, it's been, an, it's still a growing, there, we have growing pains, but it's, been very, very well received. We were all very prideful of how it's the support, the elation of so many of the community, especially the wine producers in the valley, when they see the space or what the project is. Sometimes there are more people that are more excited than us before um, we open, or now that we've been open almost, yeah, a little bit over six months. Actually, six months tomorrow, July, uh, December 13th. Um, but it's been a great project. It still is. I'm really, really excited and what we are going to do in the future as well for this restaurant. Okay, so you've covered a lot. Uh, thank yeah, you. I've thank been you around the block, like thank I you said. For that. <laughs> um, but me. it's always been with food and beverage, especially with Oregon wine. Um, I, just to insert it, I was also at Bamboo Sushi for a little bit, and one of my greatest accomplishments, and I, I'm proud, very proud to say, is when they expanded 
bamboo to other states. I made sure that that wine list was Oregon wine focused by the glass. I switched that from maybe one or two Oregon wine glass to where it was 90% Oregon wines by the glass. Because this is like your, your home base is Oregon, your wine list should be Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the places that I've been to, I made sure that was one of the goal in the program is you're in Oregon, you should be drinking Oregon wine. Along that line, tell me about how your approach to building a wine program, wine list, has sort of evolved over the years. And when you get to a place like this where you're told, build a dream list, how, does that, how, have, how has that manifested itself here? Okay, to start with, I think when I was younger and younger in my career, um, you just kind of been knowing like the popular names, the big names, the, the, the high scoring points. You wanted that and you almost wanted that all, always for it just to sell. Uh, and just to say, yeah, look at my wine list. I have this, I have that. It evolves over the years to where my palate also has evolved. Uh, my my passion and love for champagne and Oregon and sparkling wine has kind of been the number one that most of my, my friends and my colleague knows me about. Uh, so it had evolved from that, from your big name, big house champagne to grower champagne to single uh, varietal Blanc de Blancs or single uh, vintages of uh, champagne or things like that. So it has evolved from there to a little bit more balance and curating a wine list that has a little bit for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, to backtrack on that, writing a wine list or helping writing a beverage program is usually, for the places I've worked for, is based on the cuisine as well as what sells. Uh, you always have to always think of the business as well because you can't just write a wine list just because you love it. Uh, there are wines that are put on the wine list that are like, I don't care for it, or this is not the greatest wine that I've drank, but I know well enough that my audience for that restaurant will love it, or I can sell this. Uh, you balance it with <laughs> post off uh, sale from a distributor or allocations mm -hmm. as well. Um, Coming to this program, it was still a little bit daunting to me when they told me to write a wine list just because, or to write your dream wine list. What's my dream wine list? It could be defined as all champagne or all vintage wine, all vintages or all library wines. But you, like, no, that's not your dream wine list. Your dream wine list is the perfect wine list where you can have someone that could just come to the bar and wants a glass of really, really good Pinot Noir, but it doesn't break the bank, or a bottle of this, or a bottle of that. So you have to think of that. I think maturity comes to that, mm -hmm. um, experience. Writing, it's still not there. I don't believe it's not there. There's more work to be done on this wine list because Chef Matt's cuisine is continued to change and continue to progress. The items on the menu needs to reflect some of the wines. Um, so, but right now, um, I'm very, very fortunate and really, really thankful and humbled to all the winemakers that has shared their library wines and open up their library wines and continue to open them as well. Uh, searching for the eclectic varietal is also another goal where part of it is also part of that is to educate or at least share that to our audience or to our diners, mm -hmm. uh, not just eclectic varietals locally, but uh, from around the world, any wine region. Um, or also sharing vintages that most people think would not be a great vintage, but it has evolved over the years. Or young Pinot Noirs that most people are now like, oh, it's too young, it's not ready. Maybe there are people that love that style of wine as well. So it has evolved into more, I guess, um, complete, more rounder style of building the wine list, not just for the cuisine, 
or for what you can sell, but also honoring the history, specifically the local history of Oregon wine, as well as the ethos that we believe in and collaborate that, or at least finding those winemakers and producers that has e the same ethos as us in order to, again, not just focus on one thing, but be a little bit more well-rounded well and versatile. Mm -hmm. Tell me about getting to know the industry once you got here. To, uh, how did you go about meeting people? Who did you seek out? And how did you kind of build your sort of roster of people that you know in Oregon Wine? Um, I think I mentioned earlier that when I got to Oregon and Mike and Jan Sweeney said, learn how to run a tasting room, and I went around and tasted wine, I just kind of built that up, introduced myself. Um, from the Argyles of the world to the Mandarin and Sokol Blasters of the world, they've opened their door. And it's been an honor and always been an honor to do that. The relationship was to keep continuing building that relationship by not just using their wines in your wine list, but being supportive of them via uh, volunteering for IPNC, volunteering for Classic Wine Auction and Salud and Willamette Valley Wine Recession. Um, I don't know if I really seeked out anybody specifically. I just kind of like made myself be known to like, hey, I love Oregon wine. I promote Oregon wine. I'm going to be the concierge of Oregon wine. I, I, I kind of joke around and still joke around saying that I'm Switzerland. I wave the white flag um, because I don't have a favorite, nor do I have this or that, but I do. I mean, you always have a favorite, but I can't name names right now. Um, you can come back to me later on a different note. But anyway, yeah, um, the entire probably, I'd say, majority of the Willamette Valley winery producers have been really, really graciously opened their do doors. When I email someone to say, hey, in my experience, just give you an example here is like, hi, I have someone that really wants to try specific Pinots or specific this, and this is their itinerary. Can you please entertain them? And they said, of course. Mm -hmm. um, being that, being the, the industry promoter or the wine industry promoter has like, has opened the doors for me because I do, I do go out to seek out them by volunteering on harvest, um, going to visit them and understanding, learning, keep learning to them, uh, whether I talk to Roland about what's his new project on his new sparkling wine or um, hang out with, or at least bug, uh, Jay McDonald and say, hey, what are you doing? Can I come and just taste some wine with you? Um, or just stop by at Argyle sometimes and said, what's new? What's the new release? Because I haven't tasted the new release because I can't taste every wine, right? So just visiting and just continuing to be their neighbors that, um, and treat them like the way they tre have treated me over the last 20 years. So. You use that term concierge to Oregon wine country, which I love. That's a, such a great, such a great term. Um, how has that role for you sort of evolved? And, and, and are you finding more and more people coming here that you are sort of connecting to Oregon wine? How, how has that changed sort of in your career in terms of number of people coming, number of people coming through you into Oregon wine country? Um, in the beginning, it would be just like whoever I can recommend and then now it's more specific, right? They're seeking out things. It has evolved by a lot of people will either email me and said, we're coming back to Oregon and could you help us go to these places or go to that places? I don't know if he's really transcend into more different ways, but I think over the years, it's just more a matter of who's new, 
uh, who's making the best Chardonnays at the moment just because Chardonnay is now a big thing in Oregon, right? Or who is making a, a trend in aging their Pinot Noir in different vessels? Um, I'm not sure how to answer the entire question now. So <laughs> I think it, it's just evolved over the years on um, when, in my experiences, when somebody said, we've never tried Oregon wine, however, we love Pinot Noir. Is Oregon Pinot Noir as good as what we read them? And I will gladly say yes. I would gladly say yes, and I'll stand by my word on that, uh, that we are now be able to compete with some of the greatest Pinot Noir producers and Chardonnay producers in the country. So I'm solidly continuing to be that. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the project here. Obviously, you mentioned kind of how you got involved at Okta. Tell me about, at its heart, what Okta is and what, what you're trying to present on a kind of a nightly basis here. Well, um, uh, to what I've heard from Chef Matt and what we've been kind of started, Okta is an entire immersive hospitality, not just on the food, but the entire experience, um, utilizing our farm. Um, and you let utilizing produce at its peak. So be able to showcase those product at its peak and share that to our diners. Uh, how, with the wine program, it's still a kind of a learning curve uh, just because at the moment, our wine pairing it's kind of like the most popular thing when it comes to looking at the beverage program um, is that people has been just mostly wanting to do the wine pairing for each of the courses that we serve every night. Um, Okta is a continually progressing. We're, I get, like I mentioned, it's, we're only into our sixth month. Um, I'm learning, learning, and more that our diners are more adventurous than I thought. Um, because I'm, once in a while when I see someone or someone make reservation and said it's wine pairing standard or that they love Oregon Pinot or they've been to many Michelin stars, etc., I have to step back and say, and kind of review what the wines that I'm being poured at that evening. But once you get to know a couple of conversation at the beginning of the meal with people and they kind of reveal themselves a little bit about their wine experience, you can, I, we're very quick to pivot a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and we like that. We enjoy the challenge in that because Especially when somebody literally will reveal to say, "Oh, we don't like we don't like Chardonnay, or we only drink red wine." And then I would, in the last couple of months, I would take a look at my sum, and I'm like, "What are we gonna do now?" Um, but you're learning and that, and we just have to be adaptable and be like pivoting a little bit without compromising what we're doing um, and showcasing. Um, definitely 50% or more of Oregon wine in our pairing and the intention of pairing each dish with each specific wine that we believe would pair best, not just because it's good or it's delicious with the dish, but it's also the stories that we tell mm -hmm. about each of uh, the producer. Mm -hmm. Perfectly pivots into my next question. Tell me about the stories you tell. You talk about wine. We talked a little bit before off camera about sort of wine and the, as a collection of stories. How do you get to know and understand uh, the story of a wine, and how do you feel is what what is your role in sort of portraying that to the customer? Um, I, that I would consider it. I'm the storyteller. I am. I hope that I am doing justice to each of the bottle that I open of how a winemaker or a producer would want it for us to share to our diners. How do I go about that? 
I think it starts with really getting to know the producer for and what's in the bottle. And from there, you kind of dig deep a little bit more on who they are, what they has, uh, who the producers are, and who are the people behind it, and tell that story. And most of the time, I just tell the story without even telling how good the wine is, because the, the story is as good as the wine sometimes, most of the time. And you fall in love with that because of all the, like, the passion that these winemakers, um, I would like to share that story to every single diner that how, what the passion and hard work that these winemakers have done to put these beautiful, delicious juice in a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, I tell that story just by, like, again, uh, I keep learning about, about them, the, who they are, and getting to know them more and more by visiting winemakers and specific producers multiple times of the year um, because they will tell you a story of what happened on Bud Break all the way to the last bin that they dump into the presser. Um, so just getting to know them more, mm -hmm. I think, is a really valuable uh, part of my job as a storyteller. Because mm -hmm. um, we want to know why you named this a cuvee, right? Or how the label come about. And that's just part of what the entire experience of the wine industry. In your experience, have you found that certain stories resonate more with customers? Yes. I think the godfathers of Oregon Pinot Noir, how they started, will stick more and more to the guests that they gravitate on it. And they're like, I would like to see that winery, how they got started, where they're at now. Mm -hmm. And also the independent stories, those that really, really keep forcing themselves into making sure that they're not just making wine for the money, that it's not just a business, it's what they love to do. You mentioned earlier the difficulty in, in sort of try, it, there's so much wine and you you have a lot you can so how do you seek out your list as your how do you keep track of who's new who's doing some who's doing something uh, different uh, who's coming to the valley or, or or elsewhere how do you sort of stay in touch with the industry on, on that kind of basis? Uh, I think the the couple of the more the resources that right now kind of using is the Willamette Valley Winery Association, the Oregon Wine Board, and you guys. It's <laughs> always a good source. Uh, from there, you're always going to hear some, somebody is coming new. And with that said, I do taste a lot of wines. It is, at some point, a dilemma because I want to put everybody on the list because everybody's making great wines. It's just different for every personality or every... Uh, uh, every different AVAs or every different vineyards. How do I select that? Well, it's just a matter of really, again, understanding what's next on our menu and also what are people asking for mm -hmm. and also based on experiences, uh, consistency as well, and also like really, really understanding specific vintages, because each vintage of the Willamette Valley will have a different resonance to other people. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to rotate. I think rotational is a good thing. Uh, I think most of the producer understand that A wine list can't put every local wines on their menu, so it, it's good to rotate because it also gives you a chance to like to not be so stagnant about what you're pouring or what you're selling. Um, but one day I hope to have every single at least, or how do I say this? At least each AVA is represented on the wine list with a balance, whether it's white wine or Pinot Noir or sparkling wine, mm -hmm. so. 
Um, you mentioned earlier, obviously, champagne, sparkling wine is kind of your, your main, main love right now. And you also said you could talk about it all day, so I'm going to give you a chance to talk more about uh, what's exciting to you about sparkling and champagne and um, how, would, how does that fit into the list here? Well, um, what's exciting about champagne is they are more and more discoveries of grower champagne that I didn't know exist, or at least new producers that are has always been connected with the big names or other producers. What's exciting in Oregon is the increasing amount of producers that wants to produce sparking wine because they we have Pinot Noir in Oregon and some people are have Pinot Meunier and then Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are the two most consistent uh, blend in sparkling wine, right? Uh, whether it's a 100% Blanc de Noir or 100% Blanc de Blanc or it's a Cuvée of blend. But also what's exciting is there are more and more I could send, consider fourth, fifth generation of young new blood winemakers that have studied with the godfathers of Oregon winemakers that are wanting to show off what they have studied in a different way, almost kind of like paying homage to what they have learned. Uh, for example, um, I've discovered over the last year or so, Pinot Blanc is an amazing sparkling wine. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is an amazing sparkling wine that there are now local producers. They're specifically all sparkling wine, that that's all they're concentrating and it's the one that expertise that they want to do. So it is not just fun for me. It's really, really exciting for the industry to have that much choices because competition is good, right? Uh, price point competition is also uh, really, really good for the industry. And I hope that one day, like, Almost everyone should have a sparkling one because it gives you the versatility of what you want to drink and it also increases your uh, uh, audience um, because there are like me that, oh, I feel like I want to go wine tasting today, but I want sparkling wine as part of it. Um, I'm actually helping someone uh, next week and their focus is all sparkling wine and that's going to be a fun for me and selecting at least three maybe seven different uh, sparkling producer both old and upcoming uh, sparkling producers uh, to my count um, I think I have at least 20 producers and there are at least more than 50 producers that I know of however um, as we all know Andrew Davis makes all and kind of help all with all the sparkling wine being made in Oregon or in the Willamette Valley and I know he told me that there's at least over a hundred that sparkling that are making sparkling wine in the valley and some of those are secret some of them are out there right now um, but I want to make sure that I support all of them because again it, it's fun and not only that bubbles for everybody sparkling is for everything you can eat, you can pair sparkling wine with everything, as long as it's well made. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> so you've talked a little bit about some of the changes you've seen in sort of the addition of Chardonnay, addition of sparkling wine to a lot of producers' portfolios in the area. What are some of the other changes you've noticed in the Oregon wine industry since you've been a part of it? What does the industry look like to you now at the end of 2022? I think the biggest change is that I, we've seen in the, over the last five years and currently is really, really digging into the farming. Um, you can consider it natural farming or natural winemaking from there. There's a big, there's been more and more of that shift to, um, I, w I wouldn't say not intervening but just going to the old ways of how they farm before, not just the pesticides or insecticides, etc. It's like the no-till, um, using cover crops, and really focusing on 
using in like wildflowers that normally just being grown in that. I think the farming is the biggest aspect that I've seen as the big change. Um, what would be the biggest shift? I think more and more is also I've seen the hospitality aspect of it, providing more than just tasting room into getting to know your wine is there's a full immersive experience in visiting a winery where they start with, yeah, they'll start you with tasting and suddenly they go completely give you a tour and taste you some barrels. And then after that, also more and more uh, of tasting room that I know, I know a few have changed it to where they're providing um, snacks and, uh, comp and food mm -hmm. to go with the wine to get the entire experience instead of just boozing it up like the last, I don't know, decade. Like, I'll give you an example. Is a, a, the big wine producer, a sparkling wine producer in the Valley, have seen a dramatic increase as well in the quality of guests that are visiting because they're now using a reservation system. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other one. I think it helps control your costs, it have control your labor, and that's all a big part of being sustainable, right? Um, to keep going and to give the best experience. So when somebody make a reservation, you get to give them your entire hour or a 20 minute or a 30 minute experience, whatever they sign up would be. I think there's more and more of that. Uh, I've seen it to where a couple of the tasting room is, do you want just a tasting experience or do you want an entire tasting and visiting the, the fermentation room kind of experience? So it goes from like one hour or three hours. Um, like I, I just visited one where they gave us a tour and then, then there's an entire menu and a private chef. Uh, there is more trend towards that and I hope to see that more trend. I think it's really good for the industry, not just for visiting uh, um, tourism or people that are coming from whether out of state or out of the country. It's good for the local scene as well because the more of that goes, you can, you're supporting your local farmers. You're supporting um, the a labor force of restaurant industry that might not want to be in the restaurant but still want to be in the food industry and you have a private chef and you have servers and there's more continuing to like that develop I think you'll see that big trend coming up in the next two three years it's it's already starting there it's already there. there's already a number of wine make wineries and tasting room that I know that are like yeah, it's starting next year. Uh, we're going to be serving this or this and creating a little a more like that dynamic, uh, immersive experience. Mm -hmm. It's not just about like, I'll take a flight of your Pinot Noir, please. It's not just that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's more like tasting rooms are more educated, um, tasting more like exchanging ideas and partnerships. I've seen three in, over the last couple of months where hey, we'll be pouring at this winery, come, come see us. Or these three other wineries go to a specific um, location and they're all pouring their wines. There's more of that collaboration so you can do a one-stop tasting. Mm -hmm. okay. So in addition to that kind of growing and, and evolving, what else do you see as you look ahead for the Oregon wine industry? Um, what else is that I think will be like more and more better quality, higher pricing, which is good for the industry, and more diversity in clonal or varietal clone, uh, planting. Mm -hmm. I know that's already been started for that, but there's a little shift in that. Like for example, I, I learned that a gentleman planted his 35 acre 20, 30 years ago with not just Oregon Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. He, he had Viognier, Mencia, Tempranillo, Sauvignon Blanc, Melon de Bourgogne, Pinot Gris. I think with the shift of the climate change and what we're experiencing right now, 
more and more of producers and vineyard experts are starting to like, can we plant Nebbiolos? Can we plant more Gamay Noir on this site? What's going to happen 10 years from now? Um, because they are discovering 20, 30 years ago, somebody did that and they were laughed at or they're like, are you crazy? What are you doing? And now those vines are thriving and producing through to the character and profile of that specific wine varietal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying that just because I've been purchasing this Viognier that I love from the beginning from Jessica Museko's A Fee, mm -hmm. found out that Vineyard has polyclonal varietal that was planted 30 years ago because the gentleman that sold his property dined in here and he told us all about it because he saw, it's like, you have the Viognier that I used to grow. Yeah, it's next there, next to my Melon de Bourgogne. It's like, what? <laughs> You have Melon de Bourgogne in that vineyard too. Oh yeah, I also have Pinot and Mencia and Pinot Noir. And they're all successful and they're very sought after right now. Um, so that, um, I hope that keeps going um, because it's fun for me as a wine buyer and a sommelier to have a local producer that I can complete a whole range of a flight of wines to pair with our food because I can literally go from sparkling wine to a dessert wine all the way to dessert wine and I could probably pour or local wine that I don't need to dive into the old world the wine that's really really exciting for us and for the industry mm -hmm. um, because again like I said I'm the concierge of Oregon wine like right drink local eat local and if somebody, and we've had a number of people, I'll give you an example, we have a number of guests now that I just want all Oregon wine. I want you to show off what you have as Oregon wine. And that's when you're like, yes, this is what I want. This is like, yes, it's starting there. It's going there. And that's really, really fun. So what about what comes next for you? Obviously, you've had quite a journey to get here. Yeah. Tell me about what's upcoming uh, at Okta and, and also upcoming sort of for you just uh, in wine or outside of wine. What's coming for Okta uh, next year? Um, I don't have all the details yet, and I can't. No. We're going to do more food and beverage programming here, and that's exciting because I get to dive into that events and, like, being creative and having fun with all the different beverages as well as showcasing the local wineries as well as international wineries. So that's coming up next, but I should get more detail. What's next for me personally? Um, I moved I moved from Portland to McMinnville uh, right around April, May before we open. I would love to find a place and settle in the valley with a little property and really, really dive into what, like when I first got to Oregon said, I can live here and I've arrived, is that I can find my own property. Um, the dream could happen, could not. Uh, making my own sparkling wine. Um, whether it's gonna happen or not. Would love to dive into something like that in the next couple of years, but this is the focus mm -hmm. and um, making sure that we're doing our best to show off the incredible amount of bounty that Oregon have. And we're just really humbled to be a part of the Willamette Valley and downtown McMinnville. Mm -hmm. all the questions that I have for uh -huh. you, Ron. Is there anything I, didn't, anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we'd like you didn't cover or that you'd like to cover? Um, no, I think the only... That's it. It's fantastic. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. I traveled then. Thank you. Sharing your stories with us. Thank you very much go as ahead, well. I'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Yeah. Thank okay. you.